Buenos días. Eh, buenos días, bienvenidos a la Yale Industrial Day. Uh, voy a comenzar hablando en castellano y luego ya cambiaré a, a inglés, ¿de acuerdo? Ante todo quería disculpar al director de nuestra Escuela Universitaria de Informática porque, bueno, eh, tenía pensado estar aquí para hacer esta apertura, pero al final pues no le ha sido posible. Eh, ante todo, bueno, quiero agradecer a todos que estén aquí y eh, voy a cambiar en uh, inglés ya. So, welcome to all of you to uh, this Agile Industrial Day in our school. Uh, I, I want to apologize to the director of our school because uh, he, it has, it, he has not been able to be here because other com last time commitment, but he, he would have liked to, to be here and make this opening. Why we or decided to, yes, to, to organize this? Because, well, we have the, the chance to have excellent speakers here and we thought that, uh, yes, uh, Agile is a hot topic and, and it's an emerging topic for, for industry in, in our country and other countries. And this, this chance to, to bring closer uh, uh, excellent speakers and industry and put them in contact was an opportunity we could not lose. And, so, uh, yes, as you see, we have here uh, a balanced uh, speakers from academy, from industry, from Spain, from out of Spain. So I'm sure you will get a very good input from, from this Agile Industrial Day. As well as speakers, we will have a panel, as, as you know, in, in the afternoon, with also panelists that, uh, again, are some of them are, have been speakers, some others have not been speakers before, but in any case, uh, ha have a real, uh, real experience to communicate to you. The agenda, uh, we have some, some, uh, some delay, but I um, think we can catch up with it. And uh, the idea is that we have uh, an opening, uh, a first presentation by Professor Philip Cruton from from uh, Colombia from uh, from Canada okay and then we'll have a coffee break and two other presentations and lunch time will be 1 p.m. and then we have a presentation uh, by Dr. Alan Brown from IBM and the panel okay in principle the time we have for closing is 7:30 so uh, we want also to thank our contributors, uh, that, uh, our IVM, Everest, Agile Alliance, and our school, and also some other collaborators that Telefonica has helped us, and, and University of British Columbia, Indra, Everest, and IBM, and our department, and also Asociación de Técnicos de Informática that has helped us to, to, to uh, disseminate this event. Okay, so I think it's, yes, leave ground to the first speaker. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the people from the Technical Computing School of the Polytechnic University of Madrid for co-organizing this event with the Rey Juan Carlos University. And secondly, I would like to thank also to Philip Krusten for coming here because I think it's a, an excellent opportunity to have Philip uh, been in Europe for several weeks and visit us in Spain for, for giving the, the keynote to speak. So, Philip is uh, a person who is very well known, so it's, I think he doesn't need too much presentation, but for those people here who doesn't know too much Philip, Philip is, uh, Philip Krusten, Dr. Krusten is a professor of software engineering in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. He has been working for industry for more than 30 years. 
in uh, several in large software intensive systems in several domains like telecommunication, defense, aerospace, and transportation. But also part of his experience is related to to the development of the famous uh, rational unified process and also the four plus, four plus one architecture view model. So his current research is related with software architecture in general and architectural design decisions and uh, agile software development. So if some of you sometimes could be, can enjoy or have been boring with the, the heavy uh, rational unified process. Now we will try to put some or a bit of agile in our software engineering lives on behalf of the presentation of Philip. So your presentation I think is putting agility in context. Thank yeah? you. Thank okay. you everyone. Thank you Rafael. Thank you very Good much. morning. There was these two ladies at the hotel, French women, they couldn't speak any English or any Spanish. They kept saying, Buena sera, buena sera, this morning, <laughs> yesterday morning to the waiters. Sort of, they're weirdos. Buena sera. Um, so let's do some uh, in flight uh, change of uh, bit flow. Ta da! Ta da! It worked. We didn't have uh, a stupid. Uh, moment there. Okay. What did I do with my remote control? Here's my remote control and I'm going to sorry for the noise. Okay, so I'll try to put uh, agility in context today. Yep, they already told you uh, after working uh, in industry, uh, I've reached my ultimate level of incompetence, you know, and the Peter principle, you first do things and then you coach a few friends to do things with you, and then you start speaking about how to do things, and then you write articles about how to do things, and then you write books about how to do things, and, and then finally you teach undergrads, so <laughs> nothing bad can happen. Well, in, in order to keep in touch with industry, which I left uh, around uh, 2003, uh, after IBM bought Rational, I, I do consulting with some of my children who are engineers too. And uh, the reason uh, uh, Raphael mentioned uh, that they grabbed me is that I, I have one of those few perks in academia which is called a sabbatical year and I spend half of it in Amsterdam. Um, the, the key message of my presentation is here. Uh, there are certain context attributes that you have to take into account when you look at adopting agile practices. Um, there's eight that seems to play a big role and I'll, I'll go uh, through them in detail. And um, one uh, interesting grad student I work with in, my, in the first part of my sabbatical in, in uh, Wellington, New Zealand, uh, she called it the octopus, Philip's octopus. So we're going to speak about the octopus today. Uh, so I'll try to define what agility means uh, it's not an easy thing. Then we'll go into some strange thing called the Agile sweet spot where things seem to be working fine. And then I'll tell you a few nasty things about what happens when you try to go outside of that sweet spot. Um, and then I'll present you a little bit of a conceptual model of software development to introduce these factors that seem to affect how successful or unsuccessful you're going to be with this or that agile practice. So how in practice we can use this octopus to reason about the, the practices and to reflect on how we're using the few good things that uh, um, agility offers us in software development. And then maybe we can try to reach a, a better definition of uh, what agility means. Um, the slides are available. Towards the end, I'll give you a pointer to where they are on the net, so you don't have to furiously take notes and, uh, or take pictures of the screen. Or... Okay, so uh, not wearing my prof cap, but wearing my uh, consultant cap, I, I do uh, some consulting in a few companies, mostly North America now, and as close uh, to Vancouver as I can because uh, I'm a bit tired of traveling. And I asked them in various form, agile, are you agile? And they say, oh yes, we agile. We follow method X, Y, Z from you know, this great guru and we have all his books and 
he signed them for us, and so we implement all the practices, therefore we are agile. Um, Sometimes the answer is yes, we've studied the Agile Manifesto and we're perfectly conformant to every single aspect of the Agile Manifesto. We threw away documentation. And, uh, um, sometimes the answer is more lukewarm. Yes, we are Agile. We, it's, we are Agile because we say we are. Uh, or it's defined negatively. Oh yes, we, we don't do waterfall, therefore we must be Agile, isn't it? Um, or you have the sophisticated answer with some, you know, big words. We are chaotic, collaborative, and streamlined. Therefore, we are agile. Actually, the people who invented the agile movement had a, a, a fantastic marketing coup because who does not want to be agile? You know, oh, we don't. We want to be not agile in in our company. I mean, nobody wants to say that. So they they sort of hijacked a word that you know, seems to be quite obvious. So, at which level are you agile? Are individuals agile? Is a development team agile? Is it the whole organization? What does it mean? Is there some metric of agility? How would we say that this team or this organization is more agile than this one? Actually, somebody, Brian Anderson Sellers and a gentleman called Kumar, they've tried to define some kind of a scale of agility where you can sort of take an organization and measure a few things and say, you are 22.7 on the scale of agility. There's also all these false dichotomies that we've seen, you know, agile versus X. Agile versus waterfall. This is, this is the usual one. The waterfall is this piñata that people sort of hit up upon, sometimes not really knowing what they're describing. They all blame it to Mr. Winston Royce and his famous paper from 1970, which nobody has read, which, by the way, has quite some iteration into it, if you read it carefully, if you go past you know, page uh, six in the paper. So there is this agile versus discipline. You know, they are disciplined people who do software in a very disciplined fashion and they are the agilistas. Uh, this was the very unfortunate title of a very nice book by Barry Boehm and Richard Turner, Agility versus Discipline, as if you didn't have to be disciplined to be agile. Uh, agility versus plan-driven. Do we develop the plan, you know, uh, and then work according to the plan. That's a little bit what we got in the early years of trying to apply the PIMBOK to software development. The PIMBOK was mostly developed by people from civil engineering. I know one of them is my neighbor in Vancouver, is a very nice retired civil engineer. Well, yes, sure, in civil engineering, you do a lot of heavy duty planning uh, on all aspects, and then you try to work the plan with very little deviation. Lightweight versus heavyweight. Yep, you know, we're agile. We don't use any of those heavyweight methods like rep or something like that. Um, I get into a lot of discussion because of my interest in software architecture in agility versus architecture. Oh, we don't want any architecture here. It's no, no big upfront design, you know, in our project. The architecture is going to gradually emerge as a matter of weekly refactoring. So we don't need to worry. It's going to emerge someday. So, I think there's a, a more interesting perspective when we contrast agility. It's how much adaptation do we need to have versus how much anticipation can we do? And it's not one or the other. Different organizations will be in different places on this axis. Uh, one of the best definitions of agility comes from Jim Highsmith who used to be a Cutter Consortium, but now I just learned a few days ago has moved to ThoughtWorks. Uh, agility is the ability to both create and respond to change in order to profit in a turbulent business environment. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll take another shot at this one and try to refine it at the very end. Um, in a book about managing agile projects, Sanjeev Augustine um, you know, listed the, the few key characteristics of uh, Agile thing. It's iterative and incremental. Uh, they focus on small releases. It works well with people collocated. 
Um, you have usually two levels of planning, a level at the release plan, managing um, a feature backlog and then iteration or sprint inside a release cycle, uh, focusing on more day-to-day -day task. Um, a lot of processes can claim to be like that. And I'll spare you the slide about the Agile Manifesto, or maybe not, yeah. So quickly, Manifesto, tick, you know, been there, done that. There's, there's a few must in software engineering presentation. The Agile Manifesto, speaking about the software crisis, and what else? Yeah, I don't know, I forgot. So the Agile Manifesto, been there. Uh, so they are named method, you know, extreme programming has been the sort of First one visible around 99, 2000, people were at Uppsala wearing a badge, you know, RUXP. There was some unfortunate moment there, you know, Microsoft came up with Windows XP. So some people, some managers in the organization got con 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 completely confused, you know. XP, you want to use XP? Yes, yes, we'll update the OS to XP. Uh, Scrum, also a funny name, so it helped memorize it, you know, for all the rugby fans. Uh, adaptive development process, that's the more discrete stuff developed by Jim Highsmith, but lots of value there. Uh, Lean Software Development by Mary and Tom Popendick. Alistair Coburn had tried to develop a family of uh, processes, but actually only spelled out uh, a couple of instances of his crystal family of software development, feature-driven development. Scott Ambler at uh, IBM has agilified the rep for you. Uh, and so on and so on. Now, two things are not really in strict competition. I mean, you could use combination of things. You could use some XP practices and then have some tactical management of the project using Scrum practices and at the larger organization have some lean philosophy. You know, let's eliminate waste and uh, let's have more of a, of a pull approach than a push approach and all this good thing that we can derive from the Toyota manufacturing system. So they're not strictly incompatible. Now, <coughs> agility evokes different things for different people. Uh, if you speak to a French person, they'll speak about the agile rabbit. And the agile rabbit, it's not a little animal running around. It's a very famous place in Paris, uh, this place. It's a restaurant, bar, cafe, cabaret. And it's famous uh, because one of your compatriots loved to uh, hang out there around 1906-07. And he actually painted quite a few interesting paintings. I guess you know who I'm speaking to about. Um, agility can also be considered a, some kind of a culture more than a um, scientific or technological um, concept. It's more like a rhetorical or cu cultural con concept. And what is a culture? A culture, it's this fuzzy set of attitudes, beliefs, behavioral norms, uh, basic assumptions that, uh, and values that are shared among a group. And this seems to fit pretty well what we, what we have uh, in agility. So when you have a culture, there are some beliefs and some norms that are shared by this group of people. They usually rely on some values, you know, think, you know, the, the Agile Manifesto, and they drive some behavior. Oh, these people, they, they stand up in the lobby for 15 minutes every day. You know, they have rituals, you know, or they, they love to be in front of one screen with two keyboards. So that's the thing that you see. And when you join the, the culture, well, you have to adopt some of the behavior and the rituals to, to fit, but these things evolve, you know, they, they reinforce the culture, they reinforce the beliefs and the norms, um, and so on. So there's a, a, a circle that sort of reinforces this notion of culture. We can also consider agility as a memeplex. So what is a meme? A meme, by analogy to a gene, um, it's this little piece of a chunk of culture that we can isolate and give some name and we can transmit it from people to people. So it resides in our brain and we speak about it and we tweet about it and we blog about it and we sometimes people write books about those memes and they, they spread around. And a memeplex is a sort of 
you know, an, a, a set of memes that seems to work together and reinforce each other. So agile practices, you know, we could consider them as some kind of about 50 memes that uh, people have, you know, transmitted. So memes, they propagate. Um, if uh, a meme can get itself su successfully copied, it will. So that's where we have this phenomenon. Oh, you know, this pair programming or this XP thing, that's cute, you know, maybe we should try that. And the meme transmits itself. So effective memes will be those that cause high fidelity, long lasting memory. Hence, you know, giving them nice names, you know, Scrum, planning poker, you know, that helps, you know, uh, re mem memorizing the meme. And when a population of imitators start imitating one an of another, the emergent result is a culture. So that's how we got this agile culture. Now, the memes, the, the, the analogy with the genes break, uh, they re replicate imperfectly. You know, most of our genes, they re re replicate perfectly. When they don't replicate, yeah, a really nasty thing happens. But memes, they tend to degenerate. There's a rapid drift. And we'll see how this occurs. And there is, that we know, no natural selection of the fittest, unlike what's happening in natural selection, you know, in revisit Darwin. And the reason this leads to what I will call in the rest of this presentation, decontextualization. When we cut out the relationship with the natural or original environment or context of the meme. It was created in a certain context, but as it replicates, part of the drift is forgetting the context in which it was originally created. So the pattern is, you know, some industry or academic guru uh, has some success with some new practice. Describe the practice, give it a nice name, goes around the world, makes presentation, uh, pass it on to people, write a book, pass it on to other people, but suddenly, the memes start to continue to transmit itself without the original context where it was developed. And actually, this lack of context hampers adaptation. Because people do not understand the context, they think that, you know, if we do exactly as the meme is described, without trying to find out too much, we'll be successful. Uh, and they don't want to, to adapt. Come on. So this leads to uh, some nasty behavior. Agilism, bigotry, act of faith. You're not agile because you're not doing this or that. Somebody once says, oh, this is not really an XP chop because they don't do all 12 or whether it's 13 practices. I forgot, it depends which version of the book you're looking at. You know, there's all this discussion in the Scrum Alliance and I participate to some Scrum gathering about Scrum butts. You know, we're doing Scrum, but we, oh, no, no, no buts, you know, you have to do Scrum, you know, by the book. Uh, people say, oh, yeah, you're doing this, but this is so waterfall. Agile projects have two weeks iteration. If you don't do two weeks iteration, you're not agile. Well, there's only three of us in the project. Can't we do an iteration every two days? No, 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 it's two weeks. It's written in the book. There's 250 of us on three sites on two continents. You know, can't we do iteration every four weeks? Oh, no, 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 that's not agile. Four weeks looks like waterfall. You know. So you get into all these discussions, and there's plenty of that at every agile conference. My agile is more agile than your agile. Dawkins, Dawkins is one of the guys who developed this notion of memes by analogy with the genes. And uh, he had some interesting, uh, interesting write-ups uh, in, in an article the, called The Viruses of the Mind. And he says, the patient typ typically finds himself impelled by some deep inner conviction that something is true or right or virtuous. A conviction that doesn't seem to owe anything to evidence or reason but which nevertheless he feels as totally compelling and convincing. We doctors refer to such belief as faith. Now remember, software development is not just you know, natural science. It's not like there is the ultimate 
you know, truth about how to develop software, and we're only trying gradually to get closer to that truth. You know, as there is a structure of the atom, and only slowly we got to understand it better. It's just a matter of opinions. Opinions that were developed by individuals in a given context. You know, so there is no ultimate way of developing software. Uh, the same Dawkins go on. Patient typically makes a positive virtue of faith being strong and unshakable in spite of not being based upon evidence. Indeed, they may feel that the less evidence there is, the more virtuous the belief is. Yeah, for many agile practices, we don't have a lot of solid evidence scientific stuff to rely on. We rely a lot on faith. Oh, it worked for us. Yeah, sure. Will it work for us? Oh, yeah, 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 it's certainly. You know, it, it worked for us and for them too, so it should work for you. Um, we have some evidence in very limited context for some relatively narrow practices. And then we go into, you know, bigger stuff there. The sufferer may find himself behaving intolerantly towards vectors of rival faith. In extreme case, even killing them or advocating their death. He may be similarly violent in his dis disposition towards apostates, people who once held the faith but have renounced it, and so on. So, yes, you know, this is an XP shop. We hate scrum people. Oh, no, no, this is a scrum shop. We don't like XP and, and you know, flame wars on, uh, on a mailing list and things like that. So what does it mean to be agile in such a context? Well... You know, it depends. It depends precisely on your context. And a lot of people have thought about that. Um, somebody I respect a, a lot, James Barr, and uh, some of our former friends from Rational, like uh, Paul Zimkowiak, if you remember, uh, are part of this context-driven school of testing, where they start to relativize the value of practices by putting it in a proper context, rather than saying, this is the ultimate set of practices that everybody should do. The short story is that agility doesn't come in a can or in a box. You cannot buy a pack of 10, just you know, deploy it, and that's it. You're saved. It's more complicated than that. The one thing that happened is that when things were being developed, they were developed and proven to be successful in a certain context. So there is an agile sweet spot. Sanjeev Augustini was hinting at it. You know, when you have from 7 to 15 people, and yes, it will work with 3, and yes, it will work with 16. So somewhere in that vic vicinity, it will work well. It will work very well when you're collocated. Um, it will work very well if you have a dedicated team, if the people really work you know, full time or most of their time on this project. It will work for social technical system very well, maybe better than for you know, embedded stuff in devices. Um, it works well when you have, when you start, a defined system architecture and software architecture. One of the discussion I had with uh, Ken Beck, the author of Embrace Change, uh, one of the founders of XP, um, the, the famous system where he developed the original idea of XP, well, the architecture was defined when he stepped into, into that company, Chrysler. There was no effort in creating a system ex nihilo. Um, low to medium safety, nobody dies when the system fails. You know, if you're developing safety critical system, we'll see that later, it may not work as nicely by just applying the Agile Manifesto. You need to have also a friendly management environment. You cannot just do Agile in your corner while the rest of your organization has some more linear, uh, sequential mindset. Um, it works better for new development than you know, maintaining your 16 million lines of uh, COBOL code. In uh, North America, real estate people have this motto, uh, there are three things that matter in real estate, location, location, and location. Well, probably in adopting uh, a software process, there are only three things that matter. Context, context, context. So, that's 
getting at the, the center of uh, this thing, but things do not work always that well. Let me give you some example. Concrete example, you know, real project, I'll hide the name of the culprit. And somebody with good eyesight saw that it says UBC Warburg here, but that's not the company I'm speaking about. Um, so we have this large organization, it's distributed, they have a lot of legacy system, actually they're the result of mergers between three organizations. And they want to, they're basically their system is a total mess, so they decide to re-implement it. They bring initially about 30 developers, going up to 50 pretty rapidly. They use a combination of XP and Scrum. Most of those developers had some previous experience with XP and Scrum. They you know, zero in on a two-week iteration. They're collocated, they're in the same building as the end user. Uh, they have, you know, Wednesday afternoon demos to users, uh, real users from the upper floors. It's a good success, things are buzzing along fine. It's a poster project for scaling up ag uh, agile development. Uh, and I have a slide that was misplaced, so let me skip this one. Um, and then, after a few months, things start to get harder. Uh, they have a hard time keeping up with two weeks iteration. Refactoring, as uh, is the new word for scrap and rework, has started to take longer than one iteration. Um, there's no external progress visible. Uh, we won't have a Wednesday afternoon demo for the end user. Oh, you didn't do anything? Oh, no, 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 we've been very busy, but there's nothing really new to show you. And they had to stretch the iteration to three weeks. And they start to have a lot of turnover. People leave, are upset, this is not the way to do Agile, and uh, you know, we should have done this, you should have done that, you don't understand this. In XP we do that, no, but in Scrum we do this. So they arrive at a point where they have a lot of code, about 400,000 lines of Java code, and the project comes to a complete stop. Um, no clear architecture and no obvious way to go forward. Um, speaking with many of the senior team members, it was very interesting after that. It's, oh, well, you know, we could see it coming. Why didn't you say anything? Oh, yeah, well, all these people seem to be perfectly confident that the architecture will someday emerge as a matter of, you know, bi-weekly refactoring. Well, it's pretty difficult to put in place an architecture underneath 400,000 lines of code. Um, other example where you can move outside of your uh, agile sweet spot, it's in um, aerospace. So this is a subsidiary of Boeing, to uh, not hide them too much. Uh, large legacy, uh, multiple project. They decide to have four weeks iteration across the board for all projects. So they are, the whole company basically is on a single clock. And um, where things start to be difficult is that some of the applications are safety critical. They are actually installed in the cockpit of airliners. And they have all kind of constraint that seems to be completely at odds with uh, what the agilistas say. You know, they have to have extensive documentation and complete traceability from requirement to code, test, design, everything. And the agilistas keep saying, no, 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 now we are an agile shop, you know, and uh, we have to focus on the people and the code and working code and things like that, and all these things are annoying. So the distinguished engineering representative from the FAA started to be very antsy about it. You know. There was some kind of cultural clash there cultural resistance. Uh, I work in a part of Canada where we have a lot of uh, wood and we produce a lot of uh, paper. So there's lots of paper mills around Vancouver and, and uh, Calgary and Edmonton and things like that. So this is views of paper mills. You know, the huge machines, they use big rolls. That's a roll of paper there and that's a, per a person in front of it. So. These things, you know, contains lots of software. And there's all kind of funny thing that happened there, you know. Uh, first, it's not driven by interviewing end user. It's driven mostly by trying to understand the laws of physics and some chemistry and thermodynamics and all that kind of thing. So it, it doesn't, oh, you know, let's develop some user story. Where would they come from? 
which user do we want to interview there? Um, it's very hard to test. You don't have small paper mills in the software development lab so that software developers can run regression tests you know, every two or three hours or once a week. Um, uh, you actually have a you know, very fixed cycle. You, can, you, you may be able to install new software you know, on a yearly cycle. When finally we stop the, the machine and uh, clean it and things like that, then the software people have some opportunity to replace some of the many computers there. Each project, each machine is actually different. So there is different software going in each machine. So there's actually it's a, a set of medium overlapped projects. It doesn't look too agile from the outside. Um, another example is um, this financial firm. Same thing, they don't have customer to interview. They try to derive new strategies for trading by transposing physics model. So they develop new things and they try to see if it works. First by running that on past data and then finding you know, trading companies who are willing to try out their stuff. So they try to adopt XP, but some of the practices didn't quite work the way they expected, so they are a bit disappointed. So to make a long story short, there's a, a pattern. Uh, organization X wants to be agile, not always sure why, you know, we want to be agile because everybody is going agile, so we may be missing the boat if we're not agile. So they get some training and consulting. Some people come with the canned, you know, this is your 10 pack of agile, or do you want a 50 pack? Yeah, I have the 50 pack. Um, get the training and the consulting, applies it on some small pilot project. Uh, work very hard to do all the recipes there. But when they try to apply it to their real stuff, not anymore the pilot project, they don't get quite the result they expected. And very often they get discouraged and throw things out of the window. The, the first one, the, the, the one that hit the wall, they almost threw every, everything out of the window. It only restarted in a different fashion later. There's another company in Vancouver, an auctioning company. They just fired everybody who had uh, claimed that Agile would save them from their misery. You know, they... So it looked like a little bit the, the garden uh, hype cycle. You know, you have some, some people who start some nice things, uh, advertise it very nicely. You get to the peak of inflated uh, expectation. Everybody is very excited. This is going to uh, revolutionize our industry. And then there is this pff, abrupt you know, fall in the, 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 the throw of disillusionment. And then only slowly there is the slope of enlightenment and maybe reaching someday uh, a plateau of new productivity. Okay, so agile, agility doesn't come in a can. It's not one size fits all. That's the biggest mistake people have done when they adopted the RUP. You know, oh yeah, you know, let's, let's adopt the RUP, let's do everything that is in RUP. I still have this dialogue with some people, a guy from Chile just uh, sent me an email a few days ago. Well, my customer wants me to produce every single artifact that's described in RUP, you know, what, what should I do? Most approaches are valid within boundaries. Yes, I'm not saying that this doesn't work, this is stupid, this doesn't work, this is absurd, this doesn't fit. All of those things have some value, but we need to understand what value. So let me do a, a little bit of a detour via a small conceptual model of what is software development. Um, because one of the issues that we have is that the spectrum of software development project is very, very vast. So we need to understand what is common, what is really common, what are the things that we'll find in every software project, from the two-person, two-week project on some small web-based stuff, to the 255-year uh, project on some air traffic control system. There are things that are common. And then there are things that will explain a lot of the variability. So software development, in my opinion, can be explained mostly with those seven concepts, plus two that I'll introduce a bit later. Intent, 
How do we represent the intent? What is it that we want to build? And then there is the product, and hopefully the product will reflect these intents. That's what we deliver. And intent and product, they take very different shapes in different software projects. Then there is how do we bridge the gap? How do we transform the intent into the product? Well, that's work. Process may be a template for the work, may give us some ideas of the work that we'll have to plan and to do. And then, unfortunately, uh, if we could just shove intent, do the work, and produce uh, the product, we would be pretty happy. We have the wild card there, it's called people. Uh, the problem is that most of the work is not done by the machine, Eclipse, Jazz, you know, compilers, you know, JIT, you know, you name it. It's done by people. Now there are three attributes that apply to each of the four concepts there. Time, intent will evolve over time, the product will evolve over time, the work will be spread over time, even the people will change over time. Uh, quality, quality of the intent may have an impact on the quality of the product. The quality of the product is what we look at, it's what ISO 9126 tells us, you know, extrinsic quality and intrinsic quality and that kind of thing. Quality of the work, you know, process quality, uh, how people are dedicated to the, that kind of thing. The quality of the people, you know, how educated they are, how diligent uh, they are. Um, and then uncertainty and risk. There's a lot of uncertainty and risk associated with intent and with work in particular, which is the big differentiator with other kind of projects, such as construction projects, civil engineering projects, and that kind of thing, where you can resolve a lot of the uncertainty relatively early. Here in software, we, we live with a lot of uncertainty for very long. And actually, a lot of the activities that we have to have are there to reduce uncertainty. And the uncertain thing who have, which have a negative outcome, their risk. Risk of being late, risk of delivering the wrong thing, risk of having the wrong quality and that kind of thing. So it looks like this. You know, the intent represents the product, the product realizes the intent, the intent usually drives the work. Uh, the work is allocated to people who execute the work and we, the work produced the product, so we say that the people have implemented this product. And in, in some crude UML, it would look like this. And there is some environment around that. You know, wishes, needs, constraints, you know, market things come in to feed the intent. In some environment, we have other things that feed there, you know, things like regulatory constraints, Sarbanes-Oxley, Basel III, uh, some FA rule and FDA rule and TUV rule in Europe and that kind of thing. And then we have the delivered product that goes up there. There is this sort of nasty feedback loop, you know, which is defects and requests for enhancement. You know, the product, actually, when we see it, then we realize that it doesn't quite fit the intent. Uh, below the line here, that's what's inside the project. Uh, on people, we have education, experience, uh, training, new ideas, and from below, we can shove you know, new technologies. So what is a software project? It's basically all the work that we have to do by people to transform the intent into a product. If we try to do that in a small amount of time, this will be massive amount of work. You know, hence the term waterfall. But you know, we've learned to do things in small steps. So we're going to take a small chunk of intent and make it you know, a partial product. And then we're going to add some more of the intent and expand the product. So over time, we'll have smaller, gradual, little things that do not look too much like a waterfall. There are two important concepts that sometimes agilists mix up for some reason. I, um, look at a lot of presentation and I've attended a lot of agile uh, conference, it's value and cost. Value is value to the business. So it's something that we can uh, allocate to the intent before the product is done and then we can assess on the actual product when we have a product to sell, distribute, whatever. And there is cost, the cost of development, which is mostly associated to paying people large sum of money to develop software. Uh, so it's the cost of doing the work. And uh, 
Value and cost are not always related, and we could have some discussion about efficiency versus effectiveness and how one works on value and the other one works on cost. So there's some confusion there. For example, one classic confusion is, oh, we need to use something like an earned value system. But an earned value system doesn't work with the value. It works with the cost. Or it assumes that value and cost are exactly matching, strongly correlated, which is not the case in software development. Unlike laying asphalt on a road in a civil engineering project. Want a road that's twice as long? It's twice the price. OK, so that's the concept. And then we need to look at viability. Variability, there's some environmental condition, you know, the type of domain, business domain in which you work. And then this will drive the context attribute for a given project, and this should help us pick what are the good practices or process that we want to use. So this environmental condition, um, you know, what, what industry you're in. How many, how many of that thing you sell? Do you install one? or two or three, or hundreds, or thousands? You know, how many instances of that software will, will there be? What's the maturity of the organization? Are you a small startup? Now my son doesn't work with me anymore. He works on a four-people startup in Montreal. They have money for another five and a half months. Um, or are you a mid-sized software development company, like you know, Rational in 1990? or a large company like Rational in 2000, um, you know, your IBM Global Services or EDS or Logica or Cap Sogeti, uh, Cap Gemini, yeah, Sogeti, well, anyhow. So these kind of factors. There's a few things we could look at, like what is the level of innovation? Are you an organization that does, you know, um, all classic stuff again and again, just using another paradigm every five years, you know, we, we still do the same thing, but now it's SOA, you know, okay. We, we were doing it, it was object-oriented, you know, s seven years ago, and then it was, you know, um, um, I don't know, Varnier uh, 20 years ago. And there are maybe a few things about culture, which I'll revisit later, because they touch up a, a lot about the agile stuff, you know, communication, trust, you know, shared mental models, maybe education, all kind of things associated with culture. So there are, <clears throat> in my opinion, this is not the result of some scientific research using um, dozens of undergrads uh, in a um, university lab. Uh, this is the result of watching lots of projects over 30 years, uh, being involved deeply in some of them, discussing with many friends. So there's this Factors, size, criticality, you know, how many people die or how many billion dollars do you lose if the system fails? The age of the system, are we dealing with, you know, legacy stuff that has existed for 25 years? Rate of change, at which rate does the environment change? You know, the agilistas want to embrace change, but, you know, the rate of change in a paper mill is extremely low. You don't have, you know, operators that come every other week saying, oh, I have a new idea of a feature. You know, it wouldn't be cute if the paper mill would do this. You know, it's much lower than that, you know. If you look at what's happening in an airline cockpit, you know, you don't have also a product manager coming up with some fancy new idea. Like what happened when I was developing telephone switches at Alcatel, where the product manager would come up with new ideas every week. Um, <coughs> business model. Yeah, what does that mean? Well, how do you get compensated for your effort at developing software? What's the money flow? Well, this will play a role. One that uh, may be controversial, but I feel uh, strongly about it, is how much of a stable architecture is there on day one? If there is a de facto well-agreed architecture, then all kinds of practices are suddenly feasible. If there is no, nothing when you start, then it's not that obvious. Remember the project that hit a wall. They completely ignored architecture. They had no architecture when they started. Um, team distribution. Are you all co-located or are you distributed? 
uh, it starts to be distributed when they're in another building, when, when you cannot actually walk to see Joe and ask him a question. So sometimes we, th we see team distribution as, oh yeah, it's outside in India, and uh, we have the testing done in Shanghai and part of the development in St. Petersburg. Well, it starts sometimes by, oh, they're the other team, they're on the other side of the parking lot sometimes. Um, certainly, geographic distribution over many time zones is a pain in the... So I was leading a team for six or seven years at Rational where half of the team was in Vancouver and the other half was in Stockholm. That's nine hours time difference. You know, with the Stockholm people being in the, in the age range where they had kids at kindergarten, I had all this discussion. Well, we need to have finished the meeting by five o'clock or the kindergarten people will be angry which meant that the Vancouver people had to wake up at five o'clock to be in the office at six so we could have a little bit of overlap. Governance, what are the mechanisms by which we govern projects? So let's dig into some of that. <clears throat> the idea here is that some of the environmental factors that exist you know, in the, the organization will have some influence on the attributes or factors of the project. And then in turn, we will use these attributes to try to select and possibly adapt the practices that we want to use. Rather than saying, oh, let's adopt a canned agile method and try to you know, do all the practices and magic will happen, let's do it in a more careful way. Let's understand what is our context and let's pick the practices uh, the right way. So, probably the most important one is the size of the system. And it doesn't matter in which unit you want to measure the size of the system, whether it's function point or use case point or story point or source line of code or maybe just person months, you know, that's all, you know, size, number of people and duration. So this sometimes is driven directly by the business domain. I don't know air traffic control system that can be done by five people in five weeks. They're, by nature, they're pretty big and few companies around the world wants to do this kind of thing. Um, very often this is related to legacy. Uh, in some domains you have large legacies, especially the financial uh, world. Geographic distribution, because this large organization uh, are the first one who really wanted to uh, um, exploit outsourcing or at least offshoring. And it affects a lot of things, the size of the system. Iteration rate, this notion that you know, iteration have a fixed length. So, well, no, it will depend on the size of the organization, which is related to the size of the system you're developing. How much planning do you need to do? Yes, you know, we don't do planning. You know, things will emerge gradually. Well, I'm sorry, I'm a government. Before I spend a billion dollars on a system, I'd like to have a little bit of planning and telling me that you know, we're just going to do planning game every other week on our, in front of a whiteboard in a lobby. It's not just enough for my government to commit a billion dollars. So documentation, how do we manage risk, the notion of customer on site and all those things will be affected by the side of the system. Criticality. Um, I have to admit that half of my career I've been involved in software that kills, you know, um, doing things with uh, weapons. Now, weapons, they need to kill, but you need to kill the bad people. You, you need to avoid killing the good people. Um, the only difference a friend of mine told me between an air defense system and an air traffic control system, and I've worked in both, is on an air defense system, you want the airplanes to hit the ground as violently as possible. And on an air traffic control system, you want the airplanes to hit the ground as smoothly as possible. But fundamentally, both systems work the same way. They share a lot of things in terms of architecture and code and displays and all that kind of thing. Um, I've worked uh, briefly on uh, the end level of the French nuclear power plant. I don't know what's the status in Spain, but uh, my home country, France, they produce 70% of the electricity with nuclear power plants. So this is belleville sur loire one of the most famous sites. Um, that's the kind of system where you need to have software that is almost demonstrably correct. You know, that's, where, that's one of the few cases where we try to use formal method. Here, the famous method called Z, developed by uh, Jean-Raymond Abrial. 
extensive testing, audited by external agencies, every single line of code, every single minute of meeting, every single diagram has been looked upon by at least 50 people. Um, so yeah, it's a certain business domain. It's related to rate of change. Things change almost never. You know, it's pretty frozen. Uh, and it affects a lot of things in terms of documentation, testing, inspection, visibility of your decisions, and all that kind of thing. The third one is probably the age of the system, uh, legacy system evolution. You know, it's, it's much easier and much nicer and much more uh, thrilling to be developing brand new software, going boldly where no one has gone before, rather than adding a feature on a six million line telephone switch trying not to break anything in the telephone switch. So, yep, for the youngsters among you, this is a punch card. Actually, I had planted a, a Finnish punch card to poke a, jo a joke on our common friend, uh, Pekka Abrahamson, but okay. So, yeah, if you were closer to the screen, you would see that this is a Finnish punch card. I, I hated punch card because I was not a good typist. In French school, we don't learn how to type, so I was typing my punch card with two fingers. I was very happy when I had this job at Alcatel because it was these nice ladies in uh, the suburb of Strasbourg who were punching cards for us. So, so this is related to size. Uh, we don't maintain forever a tiny little piece of code, so it's when we have massive amount of code that uh, we, we need to maintain them. And it's related to testing or the lack of regression testing, to documentation or sometimes the lack of documentation, and to architecture in some more convoluted way. Rate of change. This relates to my notion that agility, it's putting yourself on that scale between how much can we anticipate and therefore do some planning early, including technical planning, and how much we need to adapt, that is react to things that change in the environment of the project. Now there are externally imposed change and internally imposed change. You know, you can have change that really come from the customer, that come from the competition, the competitors. That's why my project, my product manager at Alcatel was calling me every every week. He had a new idea. Well, he saw the brochure of Siemens or Ericsson or these other people say, we need to have the you know, feature on the phone. I said, nobody would ever use that. Well, but they have it on the Ericsson thing. We need to have a longer list of features than they have. Um, we're also affected by change in legis legislation. There are all kinds of things in large organizations that are driven also internally, you know, and driven by team evolution, restructuration, reusing software from another project, and all that kind of thing. So it's sometimes associated with business domain. Some businesses tend to be, you know, much more volatile. You know, everything that deals with the web and e-commerce and things like that seems to be much more volatile than paper mill or even telephone switches, which are much more stable, or shutdown system for nuclear power plants. It's not that volatile, believe me. Um, so this affects a lot of the practices, you know, iteration length. Why do we have to iterate furiously if the environment is not changing? Maybe we can iterate relatively comfortably and just have enough feedback to actually improve the process and have some intermediate milestone. You know? But if things change externally, maybe we need to adjust the iteration lengths to be able to react to uh, uh, outside events. So it will affect the way we do planning, how much you know, heavy planning can we do, how much tactical planning do we do for each release, for each iteration or sprint, uh, how, how do we adapt. The business model, um, how does the money flow? You know, it's very different from doing, putting a product on a commercial market, what Rational was doing, or putting a product inside a machine and putting it on the market, which is what Alcatel was doing, or doing software for the Ministry of uh, Health um, on a um, request for proposal, doing in-house development. You know, you, we are the IT department of the big you know, bank, and we are doing software for the bank, not for selling to other banks. So that's where 
the money flow is sometimes a little bit more complicated to understand. And some of the business case for doing this or doing that is very different than commercial ties between projects. It affects things like documentation, the number of instances, the notion of customer on site, communication, risk management. There's all kinds of uh, practices that are affected by this business model. Architecture stability. How much of a stable system and software architecture is there in place when you start the project? Actually, you know, most software projects, they have an implicit architecture on day one. All the big, difficult choices have been made. This is a .NET project. We have MySQL there, and we have Apache there, and we have, and we, all the code is in uh, C Sharp, and, or this is a you know, J2E project, and all the code is in Java, and we use JBoss. And very often, most of the project I see in Vancouver with the lots of smaller software companies, they have no big explicit architectural effort. Or they've made, you know, those architectural choices on day one, but sometimes, you know, there's an uh, innovative system where there is no obvious architecture on day one, or the architecture is going to be pretty complicated. It should have been the case of the, the first bad example I gave you. Somebody should have been the architecture owner there and, and drive an architectural effort in parallel with doing all kind of interesting things for the, the end user. So um, this will drive the rate of iteration. It's very difficult to iterate furiously one iteration every other week when you don't have an architecture in place or when you need to put an architecture in place. Um, and it's related with the age of the system. Geographic distribution, that's uh, uh, sometimes a big killer. Yes, I agree, we can do a daily stand-up meeting using Skype, but is it convenient? Is it effective? So very often, agilistas are trying to convince you that if you try hard enough, all the practices can be made to work. But is that the name of the game? You know, we want to do something because it brings value to the project, not because we can make it work. So a lot of things are affected. You know, all the things that deals with communication are affected when you have teams that are geographically distributed. Um, you know, all the governance also is much more complicated when you have outsourced projects, when people have different uh, employers. Um, uh, so that's, that's a, a, a big one to look at. Governance. So what is governance? Fancy new word. Some people see it as, oh, this is big process coming by the small door there, you know, and we don't want any big process. We are a self-organizing team, you know. Yes, you may be a self-organizing team, but somebody has to, de to decide that you exist as a team and the project has some raison d'être, reason of being. So there are two aspects. There are some structural aspects, you know, who has authority over what? Uh, who has responsibility, how does the communication work, not so much inside the project, but between the project and its outside world. And this will depend a lot on the kind of context you have. If it's in-house development, or if you're developing something for a big agency, a governmental agency, or something like that. Um, and then if you are in an environment that is regulated, let's say finance, health, uh, power, avionics, and things like that, then, you know, it becomes very complicated. Uh, one day I drew the whole list of the stakeholders, as uh, North American people love to call them for the Canadian Air Traffic Control System. There were 30 different entities outside of the project who wanted something out of this project or wanted to control something on this project. And then you need to put things in place, you know, measures, metrics, controls, mechanisms to ensure, you know, outside of the project that the project is, uh, is on track, that the project will achieve whatever it is that we wanted to achieve. And this is where I see a lot of the agilistas resisting this. Oh, we don't want to have, you know, metrics. We don't want people to poke our nose. Well, sorry, that's the nature of the business. You know, we have to have that. So the mechanism I suggest is 
rather than saying, let's pick up a set of practice, whether it has a name, you know, and let's try to apply them first on a small project, then let's scale them up, and we have assurance from other people that this will work, I'm suggesting look first you know, in your domain, your kind of organization, what are its characteristics, and for the various projects, where do you stand? So the agile sweet spot, when I looked at the various factors, yeah, you know, 12 would be a nice size, 8 is also a nice size, 50, as people discovered, start to be pretty difficult. There's all kinds of other things that you need to put in place. So simple system, nobody dies, probably better. Greenfield development, agile stuff will work very well there. Uh, rate of change, all right, that's, that's why it's pretty good, you know, being able to you know, adapt to lots of external change in particular. Business model, maybe in-house development in an IT department works, works well. Um, you probably need to do some adaptation to the basic ideas if you do open source. And you need to do a lot of adaptation if you do bespoke software, develop software on contract for, let's say, a government agency. Uh, works very well when you have a stable architecture. If we speak in terms of RUP, you know, if you have done your first elaboration, then you have something where you can actually do things at a relatively rapid pace and, and follow that pace and adapt to it. Collocated, it will work much better. Yes, you can make it work with distributed teams, uh, but it will work much better when people can just shout at each other, hey, Joe, you know, where's the file that blah, blah, blah. Well, if Joe is six time zone away and you have to, you know, check on the chat thing if he's on and then send him an email because he's not on and then he hasn't responded and you need to go home and you'll get an answer tomorrow. What, what is it that you were asking? So, and the cycle continues. It's not that easy. And it works much better when there's only simple rules to follow. If you have to follow some externally imposed process that imposes a lot of documentation and traceability, then a lot of the nice agile practices will start to break. So you can use the octopus in a systematic fashion. This is the upper left corner of a much bigger table that I will try to complete with some people in, uh, in uh, New Zealand in particular. So you could have the various factors, you know, size, criticality, distribution, change of rate. Um, and um, look at various practices. You know, this is an almost you know, open-ended list of practices that you can look at. And you could look at how the various um, dimensions affect things. So in green, which doesn't look too green here, uh, you could say, well, this practice is not affected by this factor. You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can do pair programming in, as long as you are two people and you can sit next to each other, you can do pair programming. It doesn't matter whether you're doing safety critical things, if you are a pair among 50 developers or among 10, it doesn't matter. But there are things where the practice need, you know, caution or adaptation. It, it won't work just out of the box. Um, you know, in, in particular, if, you're, if your team is distributed, there is a lot of things that will not work out of the box or will need to be adapted. And then there are cases where the practice is actually not useful or, you know, you should, should just, you know, um, avoid it. You know, if you have, you know, safety critical system, you're not going to push every single release in the hand of the end users. Sorry, nobody will allow to you to do that. So there are practices that will be either counterproductive or just dangerous. And I have to say that in the rest of this table, there's a lot of gray stuff like this stuff here now. Um, where I don't know, I don't have enough evidence and we haven't collected, you know, uh, running through all the things that have been published in uh, Agile conferences and XP conferences and XP days and whatever, uh, to have any evidence. So we'll need to look at this more carefully. So we can take a practice and run it by the octopus. You know, daily stand-up meeting should happen daily at the same time for a short period of time. The idea is to build this shared mental model. It's not to report to management, but report to each other. We do it standing up to avoid having it dragging forever. 
Uh, we do it shortly before lunch. That was the rule in my team. And we meet. So we actually speak to each other, although only one at a time. So what's affected? Well, size. If you have 50 people, you won't have all 50 people together in the lobby in a circle, because it'll take you quite a lot of time. And what is that guy over there? What did he say? Uh, so you need to organize things differently. Or maybe just don't do it and use some other practice to get to the same effect. So that forces you to reflect. What, what do, did we want to achieve with a daily stand-up meeting? Is there other way to achieve it? Rather than saying, oh, it's written in the book. We have to do that. So let's do it. Um, rate of change. Maybe if things are changing a lot, this is pretty valuable. So there are some factors that are additional incentive to do the practice and some factors that sort of maybe kill it a little bit. Why, why put a question mark around criticality? Uh, you, there are a lot of things that need ex to, to be explicitly documented. So a more traditional progress report meeting might be a better thing to do where we have written evidence of uh, the issues the resolution of the issues, the allocation of work, and things like that. Maybe. I don't know. We can take techniques, traditional project management techniques or non-traditional ones. You know, uh, we can look at a Kanban board and look at it from the perspective of the octopus. Or we can look at a Gantt chart uh, and look at it from the perspective of the octopus. You know, if you, if you are in an organization that manipulates this humongous Gantt chart that try to draw all the things that needs to happen in the project using a work breakdown structure extending over two years, well, you know, if you have a high rate of change, your Gantt chart is going to be obsolete after two weeks or maybe sometime two days. So the rate of change is what's killing the notion of a Gantt chart in software project. But sometimes you need to have them because software is only one component in a much larger system or product that you develop. And maybe we need to replace it with something else to monitor progress. You know, we can replace earned value system by a burn down chart or a burn up chart because it's relatively the same thing, providing we understand what we mean by value as opposed to cost. We can look at Incidents in projects, we can look at you know, the car hitting the wall and say, what happened? Well, they had no stable architecture, and they grew very, very large, very rapidly. So these two factors is something that has done it to this project. Um, so a few things to summarize. What is agility? Um, with one of my grad students, we refined Jim Highsmith's uh, Definition. It's the ability of an organization to react and adapt to change in its environment faster than the rate of those changes. So if, if you are in an environment that changes a lot, you probably need to be able to adapt and react to those changes faster. But if you are in an environment that is stable or has only one source of, of changes, you need to put practice in place that address only this input rather than just be adaptive at any cost. So remember, this is all about adaptation versus anticipation. So there's more written on, uh, on this. I've written a few papers with some nice people in New Zealand a few uh, weeks, uh, months ago. Our colleague uh, Scott Ambler has a similar little scale. He calls it agility at scale. Alistair Coburn has also some factors. It seems we are roughly saying the same thing with little variation. Um, so, if you move outside of the agile sweet spot, remember about the octopus. And we have some time for question. That's where the slides are, if you want to uh, download them for some reason. You know, creative comments. Uh, just attribution will be enough. Derivative works is allowed. If there are some really geeky people among you, um, that's the URL for the slides. Um, OK, thank you very much for the keynote presentation. So we have some few minutes for questions, five, 10 minutes. So 
Please raise your hands if you have questions about the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question related with distributed teams and why uh, monthly releases to users could be not good. Or maybe it's not the best thing to do or maybe it's a problem. Um, well, this is two questions, no? Distributed <laughs> teams and monthly releases. Three questions, two or three. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure what your question is. Distributed teams, Maybe it's a fact of life. Maybe you have no choice. Maybe your management told you, we're going to work with these people at the other end of the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, or maybe you have the choice. If you have the choice, don't. You know, you're going to put yourself into much more trouble than you expected by distributing development. Or if you distribute it, you need to make sure that the chunks that are done at the various sites are relatively consistent, that they can be relatively autonomous. The idea that half of the developers are there and the other half somewhere else, and they're going to speak to each other every day, it doesn't work too well. No. Um, so very often in large organizations, you have no choice. That's the way it's been set up. So try to make the best of it by allocating work that is relatively self-consistent in the various sites. Um, monthly release, well, it, it all depends. Maybe you want to do daily release. Maybe you want to push your software in the hands of a subset of your users as fast as you can. If you have a very rigorous process, maybe you can do continuous release. It all depends. It all depends on what's affected. So this is where there is no one size fits all. On the paper mill, I'm sorry, you cannot do a monthly release. We'll stop the paper mill August 5. You'll get 10 days to put new software on it while the people are cleaning up the mess and the sludge in the bottom of the thing and replacing some of the rolls. So it all depends where you are in that spectrum. This is why I cannot say monthly release is better than weekly release. It, I don't know. Sometimes trying to have too high of a rate of release is going to exhaust your development team uselessly. So you need to really look at what are the benefits for the organization and how to do that in a relatively lean fashion. My name is Antonio Moya, I work for Edison. Uh, we are moving to this uh, jail and uh, I understood from your presentation that you will never uh, create a system like a GSM or a telecom system, or for instance, you will never build the software for the shuttle using Agile. Is that correct? No, I didn't say that. You will use some of the Agile practices. You cannot just say, let's do XP and only XP, or let's do Scrum and only Scrum. You will need to bring other practices that are labeled by some of the agile bigots as non-agile, things from the last century, waterfall stuff. You'll need to combine all those things to make a process that works for you. But there may be very agile practices that you can embark on on day one. I find a lot of value in various teams to do a daily stand-up meeting. That's pretty valu valuable. I see a lot of value on using walls to do some tactical planning of the tactical work that happens on the day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, things like, you know, documentation, traceability, and all that kind of things, maybe you need to rely on some older stuff from last century in order to achieve success. So it all depends what success means and what the context is. So, again, it's not, oh, we cannot do this using Agile, or we can. Every organization can be Agile, to a certain extent when the organization looks at what does it mean for us in our context to be agile? How can we react to change in our environment? But there are no change in the environment. So maybe we don't need to put practices whose sole purpose is to be adaptive. Maybe we can rely more on you know, earlier planning. Maybe we can combine how the overall project for the system works with some relatively rigorous planning with you know, a more agile way of working on some of the teams that may be very tactical and have a, a very rapid internal loop. But, but I understood that you should have a, 
as uh, an architecture, system architecture, and software architecture first in order to apply those. Uh, yeah, but you agile. can develop it in an agile fashion. Somebody, okay, in, in Scrum, there is a Scrum master that drives a little bit the activities, and there is a, a, a product owner who drives the intent in my model. What they're missing, in my opinion, for challenging new systems is an architecture owner. Somebody who will make sure that the, the architecture will emerge by doing the proper activity on the architecture. Rather than saying, architecture, things from the past, big up from design, we don't need any architect here. The architecture is going to gradually emerge out of weekly refactoring. That's the only thing I say. I'm not saying, oh, if you need an architecture, you cannot be agile. I didn't say so. You can still you know, build up your architecture and build an architectural prototype using prayer programming and doing daily stand-up meeting and having short cycle. But you, the focus is to build, to put in place an architecture and to validate it. You're not going to deliver visible value to the end user on your first two or three iteration when you're building up an architecture. Sorry, Mr. Sutherland, you know, you're not going to deliver visible user value on your first iterations. But if you have a stable architecture in place, then yes, you can focus on features that will uh, deliver value to the end user. So it's again, you know, you need to adapt the practices to your circumstances. And some of the Scrum mantras may not apply too well when there is no architecture on day one. Uh, hello. My name is Javier Zorzano, I'm from Telefonica. Um, I understand that you're designing a matrix for practices and context factors. So I would you, say it would be very nice if we had a matrix like that so we can discuss yeah. in more details and have documentation and evidence in each cell of the matrix. We're not there yet. My, my point and my question is uh, about this matrix because um, uh, isn't there a risk of um, because some of the practices are mutually supporting between them. So for, uh, I think that Ken Beck says that, said that the XP practices, for example, were like a castle of cards, and if you took out just one, I don't know if this is something a bit defensive, saying you can never, if you fail, it's because you didn't do everything 100%, or because it, it really Yeah, applies. that's the easy defense of some agilistas. Oh, you failed because you didn't apply the thing hard enough for all of them, or... Yeah. Well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced about this one. Yes, there are dependencies between the practices, and a ma matrix doesn't re represent them. You, you need text to explain that, so uh, there's a third dimension there. It is true, but it's, it's already a good start if we were to look at each practice in isolation first, and look at it in different contexts, and what does it bring in that context? Rather than saying, oh no, we have to do it because it's part of the 13, and if we don't all do all the 13, Mr. Beck will tell us that if we fail, it's because we haven't done number six and number eight. I, uh, sorry, but I don't believe this. This is, this is not very reasonable. It's not rational for, for me, from the reason perspective. But I agree with you, there are dependencies. They may support each other. And, okay, the matrix is only a, a, an attempt at trying to be a little bit more objective in the way we look at practices. Okay, last question. In several months in Madrid, we, <clears throat> we are having the XP 2011 and related to um, globalizing agile. Um, the, the question is, how do you see, um, if, if we have to use the octopus to, to analyze the uh, agile globalization, for example, thinking on um, software factories and things like this, what, what could be your uh, assessment about this, about uh, agile globalization and software factories? I'm not sure I understand very well what you mean by software factories. It's a term that was used a lot in the 80s to describe software programming environment a la Eclipse or Jazz or something like that. Um, 
Well, there's two levels of globalization. We can have a globalization of the practices, and this is happening pretty fast. But then we can have globalization of software projects, and that's a different matter. You know, it's pretty easy to be agile if you are in any country, you know, that there's nothing very specific. There's some, some interplay between the national culture and some of the practices, as uh, uh, some people have, uh, have studied that. Um, but uh, it's when you try to globalize the project that you have difficulties, not when you try to globalize agile. So globalization of agile, yeah, it's happening, and it's happening fast. But uh, global projects uh, trying to use agile techniques out of the box blindly are going to suffer, for many of them, certain difficulties. They need to reflect on the value of the practice and how to support the practice and how to use alternate practice uh, to, to be successful. They're not just going to be successful by saying blindly, oh, we are an XP shop and we are distributed between Timisoara Vancouver and Shanghai. Okay, thank you very much for your questions and for your presentation. For the rest You're of the welcome. questions, we will have a discussion panel in the afternoon. So now we will have a coffee break before the next presentation. Um, so because we are close to Christmas, Philippe we will have a present for you, which is not exactly so architecture, it's building architecture. It's a nice book about building with pictures, both in English and Spanish, so, so you won't confuse Buenas Aires again. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.